Ok, buenas tardes. Vamos a empezar esta segunda sesión de los seminarios de eh, Larry Lauden en, en, nuestro, en nuestra Carta de Cultura Jurídica este año. Eh, para quien en, el, en algún momento siga estos seminarios en Internet, eh, vale la pena advertir que no encontrarán la primera sesión por razones técnicas, eh, pero creo que no habrá tampoco problema de seguir el hilo del, de, de la idea. En la primera sesión Larry nos presentó una introducción a su planteamiento del problema que eh, puede, puede en parte encontrarse en su libro publicado ya en castellano eh, Verdad, Error y Proceso Penal y en todo caso podrá encontrarse en The Lost, the lost Laws, The Work of Logic of the Criminal Law, que es el texto que estamos discutiendo en este momento, en este seminario, y que será eh, un próximo libro acerca de el, los problemas de prueba en, en el proceso penal. Sin más, y de nuevo agradeciéndote, Larry, es tu tiempo. Gracias, Jordi. Uh, bienvenidos otra vez. Um, I told you last time the, the story that, that my former colleagues in physics used to tell me, namely, shut up and do the calculation. I'm afraid that's going to have to be my message to you today. What we're going to do is review an awful lot of data and information. That, at the beginning, will seem to be incredibly boring. But believe me, there's a reward at the end. It's worth your time to try and grasp the figures that I'm going to be giving you. Given that it's going to be a fairly technical session today, I'm also going to suggest about a five-minute pausa in about an hour's time so that we can catch our breath. The next two sessions, we will be trying to draw morals from the quantitative picture <coughs> That I'm offering you. That I'm offering you today. Okay. The first thing to stress is that the data do not necessarily, in fact, almost certainly do not, in any way, apply to Spain, or France, or Germany, or Italy. These are data drawn from sources that are readily accessible to me, namely, in the United States and in England. But what's important is not so much the data themselves, because they cannot be generalized from one country to another. We have different legal systems. We almost certainly have different frequencies of error. Given the difference in punishing regimes, we probably have different ways of satisfying or violating the Laplace principle that I described to you last time. But What I hope you'll take away from this discussion is that, damn it, there are ways to rationally dis figure out whether one's legal system, wherever it is, is functioning as it should function according to the social contract. Okay? So I'm going to be giving you an example of how one might apply the Laplacian analysis the Beccarian and Laplacian analysis, to the American context, hoping that I can persuade you that it would be worth your while to apply something like the same tools, though very different numbers, to your own situation, whether you're Spanish or Argentinian or Italian or whatever you might be. Right? Because as I tried to suggest last time, until and unless we know or have a pretty good idea what the error frequency is produced by a functioning justice system, we have no idea how much confidence to put into it, we have no idea how seriously we should take its results, and that is a situation that in this day and age is intolerable. We know what it now means to say that you've got to be able to learn from your mistakes, but you can learn from your mistakes Only if, A, you make mistakes, well, that's easy to do, but B, much harder, 
if you figure out which mistakes you've made, then you can learn from them. But if you just say, well, yes, every legal system makes mistakes, that's surely true. But until you know what the mistakes are and how they arose, you can't do serious procedural reform of the rules in order to reduce the overall harm that is done by the mistakes that have been made. Okay? So, what I remind you of very briefly before we begin to talk about the numbers is this slide that I showed you last time. This is my interpretation of what the Bacardi Laplace social contract amounts to. Namely, what it says is that a responsible legal system is one that will minimize the aggregate risk of two kinds of mistakes. The first mistake is a false positive, convicting someone who is innocent. That is obviously a very costly mistake. The second mistake is the risk of being victimized by someone who was originally charged with a crime, whom the state had good reason to believe to be guilty, but who was acquitted because his guilt wasn't yet powerful enough to meet the standard of proof, right? That is this second risk, namely the risk of recidivism associated with a person who's been falsely acquitted of a previous, of a previous crime during what I call his Laplacean window. But what on earth is a Laplacean window? Well, it's easy to understand. Uh, Laplace didn't use that term. For me, a Laplacean window is the time frame that a guilty person who had been convicted would spend incapacitated in prison. That is to say, he would not be walking the streets able to commit crimes on innocent victims. Now, as we'll see in just a few minutes, in the United States, the average punishment for a violent crime, and I need to stress that I'm going to be looking entirely at violent crimes, not other kinds. A violent crime, as it's understood in the Anglo-Saxon world, is one of four kinds of crimes. A murder, a rape, an aggravated assault with a deadly weapon, or an armed robbery. It does not include attempts at those crimes. Attempts are a different matter. They don't come in the category of violent crimes. So if somebody attempts to murder me, he's breaking a law, but if he didn't succeed, that's not the crime of murder, okay? And I'm sure something similar to that is true in most other countries too. So we're gonna be looking at, focusing on, one year's worth of violent crimes in the United States, the year in question is 2008, okay? The average sentence for pers a person who is convicted of a violent crime in the United States is 7.6 years, okay. Now, who cares? Well, that defines the size of the Laplacian window because what we want to know is during a period of 7.6 years, how many crimes would a falsely acquitted person be likely to commit? Because those crimes are in part the fault of the state for failing to convict the person that the state believed to be guilty, but decided, well, his guilt isn't really firm enough that we can convict him. So, what we need to do, according to Laplace, is Consider both of these risks. These are the two greatest dangers that the legal system, the criminal justice system, imposes on citizens. You have a risk in your lifetime of being falsely acquitted of a crime, including a violent crime. That's a risk that's very serious, not because it's large, but because if it happens that you're convicted of a violent crime you didn't commit, it's a terrible harm that's being done to you 
to lock you in jail for 7.6 years when you're completely innocent of the bad act. But it's likely, equally, a harm for which the state must bear significant responsibility if it has someone who has been arrested, who has been accused of a new crime, whom the state has reason to believe is likely to have committed that crime, but not likely enough to be capable of being convicted, right? the state lets him go, he goes back out on the street, and he may well, and we'll get the details on this in a few minutes, engage in a series of bad acts during this 7.6 years when, had he been convicted, he would be incapable of performing those bad acts. The trick is to balance these two risks off against one another. And every citizen runs both these risks. The first risk is the risk of being falsely convicted of a crime that you didn't commit. The second risk is the risk of being victimized violently by someone who was falsely acquitted of a crime during the time, not for the rest of his life, but during the time when he would have been in prison had he been convicted. And had the standard of proof been lower, he would have been convicted. Okay? So, with this as the background, we can move to begin to talk about the numbers. Let me jump ahead to give you a very rough summary of what the situation in the United States looked like in 2008. You may wonder why I picked 2008 and not 2013. There's a genuine reason for doing that. Rates of recidivism are an important determinant of the second risk. So what we've got to do is to look at a situation where we already have recidivism data about who that has been acquitted has gone out and committed bad crimes. And for that, obviously, you need to wait several years to get enough data to be able to say the set of people who were acquitted in 2008 are responsible for the following 7,000 crimes or whatever it might be, okay? So I've had to wait for the recidivism data to emerge, and I'll be talking about, to begin with, what happened in 2008. How many people committed crimes? How many of them were arrested? How many of them were tried? How many were convicted and acquitted? And how many escaped any contact with the police whatsoever? I'll then turn to talk about the recidivism of those people who, while probably guilty, were arrested in 2008, had the charges against them dropped by the prosecution or were acquitted at trial, and then went out on the streets, and some subset of those people will commit crimes. And we have data about both of those things. That said, let's move ahead. Uh, as I say here, obviously, there's several bits of things you've got to figure out for yourself. How many false convictions were there in the set that we're looking at? How many false acquittals were there? Those are not children's puzzles. Those are serious puzzles. But believe me, there's an answer to them. Yeah, move that away if it's blocking you. Okay. So, the first thing we've got to figure out is, with respect to the cases I'm looking at, namely the cases of people arrested for violent crimes, how many of them were convicted, how many were acquitted, how many of those convictions were false, and how many were true, how many of the acquittals were false, and how many were true? That's the first of the two questions we have to answer. How many mistakes were there? The second part of the question we have to ask is, what is the degree of harm associated with those two mistakes? What is the cost, what is the harm to society 
when someone who is innocent is falsely convicted? And what is the harm to society when someone who was guilty of a prior crime, who was arrested of that crime, who was thought probably to be guilty of the crime, but was released and acquitted, goes back on the streets, what is the cost of the harm that those recidivists, falsely acquitted recidivists, inflict on their fellow citizens? One of the things you're going to discover, and I hope you will find it a little bit surprising, is that as, an, as a citizen, each one of us, at least if you live in the United States, is at much greater risk of being harmed in this way, namely by false negatives, by the people who received false negatives, we're they are a much greater threat to us than the threat of being one of the people who's a false positive. You'll see those numbers in just a second. So let's move on. Um, this is something that I'll refer to later, but since I've got it up in front of us, I'll just quickly run through it. These, again, I stress are American figures. These are recidivism figures, and they don't necessarily apply anywhere else. They're fairly close to the ones in England. I haven't seen the data to make a comparison with Spain. Namely, of the people who, in 2009, were arrested for a violent crime, right, approximately 30% of them had no record of prior criminal activity roughly one in three, okay? Approximately 70% of those people who were arrested for a crime had a previous record of having been either arrested for a crime, that's the 69%, or convicted of a prior crime, 53%. So, one thing to bear in mind as we move through this discussion is, we're talking about a group of defendants, more than half of whom have a record of serial offending prior to the crime that they are currently being tried for. Right? Not all of them, by the way, but 69%. 8% of them had just one prior conviction. Sorry, one prior arrest. 16% of them had two to four prior arrests. 15% of them had between five and nine prior arrests. And more than, not more than, approximately 30% of them, one in every three persons arrested for a crime, a violent crime in the US, has a record of having been arrested for or convicted of more than 10 violent crimes. That's depressingly um, bad news when you think about it, uh, that there are still people who are free on the streets who have already 10 prior arrests, and 10% of them have already 10 prior convictions, and they're still out committing crimes. <clears throat> Here is a general summary of what happened in 2008. Spain probably has, as many other countries do, and the United States is one of them, annual victimization studies where a huge number of people working for the government are sent out to interview people randomly to find out whether anyone in their household has been the victim of a crime in the preceding year. They're called viola, uh, victimization surveys. The US does 150,000 of them every year. They talk to the poor, the rich. They talk to people in one part of the country or another part of the country. And what they then do is generalize from this quite large sample to claims about the overall pattern of crime in the United States in a given year. As you can see from here, the number of victims of violent crimes 
appears to be 1.6 million. 1.6 million. Right? Now, of those 1.6 million crimes, almost exactly half were not reported to the police. You may scratch your head about that one, and lawmakers in Washington are constantly scratching their head about why the report rates are so low, but there we are. A little over one half of the, violent, of the victims of violent crime go to the police. There are many reasons people give that they're intimidated that if they report it to the police, they'll become a victim of another violent crime committed by the person who is taking revenge on them for going to the police. Or, in many cases, they're skeptical about whether the police will be able to solve the crime. Often, violent crimes take place within a marriage or between a couple. There are obviously all kinds of psychological compounding reasons why you might not go to the police and report that you were just raped by your husband or something like that. Anyway. The police learn about half the violent crimes that take place. Right. Of those, something like 600K, 600,000 people are arrested and charged with a violent crime. Of those, 380,000 are convicted of the crime. So you can see from that that about 220,000 of the people who are arrested and charged with a violent crime don't ever get to trial. They have the charges against them dropped. And that potentially is a source where we're talking about false acquittals. And we're going to have to figure out what proportion of these people who are truly convicted are indeed true positives and not false positives. And we're going to have to figure out what proportion of those who are acquitted are true acquittals or true negatives. Okay, that's where we're going. <clears throat> now, that's it. Um, you might find this mildly interesting. This shows you what's happened to criminal trials in the United States. Uh, in the last few years. Um, this compares uh, the trials. This shows how trials have become less and less important as adjudicating mechanisms in determining guilt and innocence. We have on the left-hand side the four principal violent crimes, murder, rape, robbery, and an aggravated assault. Okay. 50 years ago, something like 90% of those would have been dealt with at trial. Now, however, you see this situation is very different. In the case of murder, roughly a third of the cases go to trial, to a trial by jury. You all know what trial by bench is, right? That means trial by a judge. A defendant has the right, if he or she does not want to be tried by a jury, but does want to have a trial to request a trial by judge, the judge sitting behind the bench. That's why they're called bench trial. Okay? That's a very small number, <coughs> 2%. The cases that are disposed of by plea bargaining, however, are overwhelmingly now the dominant one, particularly if you move down to crimes here. 90% of the assault, aggravated assault cases are handled by a plea bargain. 89% of armed robberies, 88% of rapes, 62% of murders are handled by a negotiation between the defendant and his counsel and the prosecution. So the idea that trial by jury is very much alive in the United States is no longer true. It's, uh, it's rapidly passing out. One of the things we're going to need to attend to, given this fact, is we're going to have to not only figure out how many errors get made at trial, we're going to have to figure out how many plea bargains lead to erroneous judgment. In fact, that's become more important now than knowing how many trials lead to error just because of the numbers that are on the board here. 
All right, now we get to the hard data. Oh, there's a question. That was the number of uh, reported crimes, right? Actually, even even more than that, it's No, these, these are trials, of the, these are situations yeah, that have led to an arrest. Okay. Okay. From an arrest, so that, right. that's why it makes 100%. Yes, that's right. So there's no disposition by the um, prosecutor? No, no. This you have also on, if you look at table eight in the handout that uh, Jordi had circulated, if it's hard for you to read the data and you've got a, a PC, just pull it up there. Uh, it comes at, what is the page? I can find it quickly. I think it's 71 or something like that. Page 100. Yes, it's page, at least in my copy, it's page 69 and 70. Yeah. Okay. I warned you there were going to be a lot of numbers. Okay. As near as I can tell. Oh, sorry, that's a later one. Um, we'll come to this one in a minute. Let me see if I've got the earlier version here. No, I don't. Okay, it, uh, if you look on the sheet, on page 69, uh, page you have table three, violent crimes, US, right? What you can see there is, as I told you a minute ago, there were 1.6 million violent crimes. That means that the annual risk to an American age 12 or higher of being the victim of a crime is approximately 0.7%. That's the risk of being a victim of a crime in one year, almost 1%, right? Dangerous country to live in. The crimes that are reported to the police, they're 848,000. Suspects are arrested and charged in approximately 600,000 cases. And the charges look as follows. Roughly 22,000 people are arrested for murder. 36,000 are arrested for rape. 158,000 are arrested for armed robbery. And 288,000 for aggravated assault. That means that of the crimes that were reported to the police but went unsolved, there were a quarter of a million of those. Remember, 800,000 were never reported to the police. Now we have to add to that another 250,000 that were reported to the police, but the police never figured out who the bad guy was. So there were no arrests ensuing. That leaves us, obviously, with something like three, something like 595,000. I need to write these numbers up here. Of the 1.6 million crimes, 595,000 of them were actually charged with the crime. Of that number that were charged with a crime, 333,000 were convicted by a plea bargain. You can see that's much more than half. On the other hand, the number of people who were convicted by virtue of a criminal trial Right. was, you'll be surprised to hear, 30,000. Right. In short, less than one in ten of the convictions that emerge in American criminal law now arise from a trial. 
the remaining number, that is the people who were acquitted either at trial or acquitted by the prosecutor, comes to approximately, it's on the next page, 15,000 were acquitted at trial, and of the, those who were, um, had the cases against them dropped by the prosecutor, there were 217,000. Okay. So once again, the prosecutor's activities were much more important than any jury trial. Right? Juries, I repeat, only acquitted 15,000 people out of the 1.6 million um, people, uh, uh, violent crimes that took place. Uh, so the jury is moving further and further into the background. All right, now that's the hard data. That's very easy to come by. Practically every country publishes information of the sort like I've just given you. How many victims were there? How many arrests were there? How many convictions were there? How many acquittals? Okay, that data is pretty easy to arrive at. Now it starts getting a lot more baroque and a lot more interesting. Because what we've got to do is take these data and figure out, number one, how many of the 353,000 convictions were false convictions. How many of the roughly 217 plus 15, 232,000 acquittals were false negatives. Right? That's what we've got to figure out. That's, that will be step one of our two-step calculation. Once we figured out how many of these occurred, right, we're then going to have to ask ourselves, well, how harmful were each of these errors? Once we've got information both about how many, how many errors occurred and how costly those errors were, we can then bring to bear the, the Laplacian formula. We can say, okay, is this legal system behaving in such a way as to minimize the harm that it inflicts on its citizens? Okay, so we need to talk about, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry, I didn't hear. You mean how do the victimization surveys work? You have four, for a robbery, you have, you have four, for example, in death in a house, you have four victims, for example, because uh, they, they are not directly victims, but just under it. Yes, so but, but the victimization survey, if, if in a given household there were two victims of crimes, that will be recorded as two, not one. Yes, that's true, and it could, it, could, it, it, could work. it could work the other way, too. Namely, you might have one victim and several perpetrators of the crime. Right? Yeah. yeah. Yes. And one suspect could, could, could make, make uh, three crimes, four crimes. So I don't know if you know the relationship between these numbers. No, I don't. Okay, because it's big in the first number and it's very reduced. Mm -hmm. Right. Very, very yeah. That's right. Maybe in reality, no, I don't know. The number of crimes is, is, is the, the, uh, the difference is not so big in the number. Yes, well, all, the all, 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 the, all the data tell us at the moment is how many victims there were, not how many perpetrators there were, right? 
this as a number of suspects arrested. Right. Yeah. But what this does do is give us a minimum guess as to the number of perpetrators. Right, because you can't have a crime if nobody perpetrated it, obviously. Yeah. Okay, so what I want to do is move on to talk about number one, how it is that we might go about figuring out what the number of false convictions and false acquittals is. And then once we've got an approximation of that number, we're not going to get a precise figure for heaven's sake. Once we have an approximation of that number, we then will ask ourselves, well, how costly are these, each of these errors? They obviously don't have the same cost. There are different costs associated with false negatives and false positives. But if we know what, if we can eventually work out how many false negatives there were, how many false positives, and what the cost was of a false negative and a false positive, at that point we can trot out the Laplace apparatus and we can ask, is the legal system of this country functioning properly? Where properly means, is it minimizing the risk that is imposed on its citizens, either the risk of being falsely convicted or the risk of being victimized by someone who was falsely acquitted. Okay, that's where we're going. So, <clears throat> the easiest one to talk about is, of these various parameters, is the false positive. You've all heard about the work of Innocence Projects. Innocence Projects have been around in the United States now for about 15 or 20 years. Virtually every law school has its own innocence project. These are people who are professional lawyers, sometimes professors, sometimes just independent of the law school, who agree to take on cases of persons who have been convicted of a crime, a violent crime, but where there appears to be some exculpatory evidence, some reason to think that, in fact, they might be innocent. Okay. And they devote tens of thousands of hours of work to examining these people, looking at the evidence, re-interviewing witnesses from the previous trial, if there were witnesses, retesting the forensic data, if there was forensic data used in the trial. And if these innocence projects can discover enough evidence to make it look like the guilt of this person was not established beyond a reasonable doubt, or it cannot be established now beyond a reasonable doubt, that will lead to what's called an exoneration hearing. Okay. At the exoneration hearing, the judge will hear the new evidence that the Innocence Project has discovered, if need be, they will talk to new witnesses who didn't appear in the original trial. And he, the judge, will try to decide if we were to have this trial again in light of the evidence of what we now think we know, would we still say that this person is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt? If the answer to that question is no, then the person is let out of jail, as so he should be, right? and is typically paid a very large sum of money to compensate him for having been falsely incarcerated. Right? That is one source of access, but not the only one by any means, to our guess about false positives. Because what the Innocence Projects are doing is every year turning up hundreds of people who they present for exoneration hearings. Sometimes they lose the exoneration hearing, and in that case they just stay in jail where they were until the end of their sentence. But in many cases, they're able to win the exoneration hearing and thereby win the liberty, the freedom, of this person. Even though, and this is important to bear in mind, he might still be guilty because all the exoneration hearing establishes is that he is not guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. 
as I said, that's a good reason to release him from jail because, you know, we have in America, we have the rule that you're not supposed to be in jail unless your guilt has been proved beyond a reasonable doubt. But the fact that he's been released from jail because his guilt is less than beyond a reasonable doubt, that, of course, doesn't imply that it's more likely that he's innocent, factually, than that he's guilty. All it does is to say his level of guilt is roughly less than 90%. But that, of course, is still compatible with him being, in fact, guilty of the crime. If somebody's, let's say, 80% guilty of a crime, that means, in ordinary inductive logic and ordinary reasoning, um, odds are four to one he committed the crime. That means it's reasonable to believe he committed the crime, even though it would be inappropriate to send him to jail for having done so. Right? That's obvious. But there are other ways in which we can get data about false positives. Many of you, I hope, will have read a book by Calvin and Zeisel, a wonderful book, probably the best book on American procedural law ever written, that came out in the 1960s by Calvin and Zeisel. <coughs> A couple of German um, proceduralists who were also sociologists. The book is called The American Jury, and it's a fat book, but it's worth it. As far as I'm concerned, they're the first people who took seriously the idea that data is relevant to assessing the adequacy of a legal system. They took advantage of the fact that the American legal system has a number of features about it that allow epistemic access that you don't necessarily have if you're talking about a Roman law system. In particular, in particular, what Calvin and Zeisel did was to come up with the idea of looking at what they called judge-jury disagreement problems. What they did was to study about 3,800 criminal trials in Chicago and the area around Chicago over the course of four years. And in every one of those trials, these were almost all trials for violent crimes. What they did was to ask jurors to indicate whether they regarded the case they had just decided as close or not close. Right? And more importantly, they asked the judge, do you agree with the verdict of the jury? Right? Because, of course, the judge has no say about what the verdict will be. The jury decide what the verdict is. In something like about 20% of the cases where a defendant was acquitted, the judge would have convicted him. And that means not merely that the judge thought he probably did it, that means the judge thought the evidence was sufficiently strong to convict that person beyond a reasonable doubt. But the jury didn't think that. Okay. Now, unless we believe in the infallibility of judges, which I certainly don't, that doesn't prove that in 20% of the cases, the jury got it wrong. But the fact that there were so many cases where the judge in question who, after all, saw much more of the evidence than the jury did, because in American law, in a typical criminal case, huge amounts of the evidence are excluded. The judge sees them, but the jury doesn't. And therefore, there's prima facie a case to be made that A, given the judge's experience, and B, given that he has seen much more of the evidence than the jury has seen, his judgment is probably more reliable than the jury's judgment is, even though there are 12 jurors and only one judge. In any event, what he found, as I said, what he reported was that 20% of the time when the jury acquitted someone, the judge said, 
they should have been convicted because I, the judge, am persuaded that their guilt had been proven beyond a reasonable doubt. What about the other way around? What about cases where the jury convicted somebody and the judge, when asked after the trial, says, no, I wouldn't have convicted him. Calvin and Zeisel, by the way, always got the reasons that the judges had for why they would do something the jury didn't do. In the case of convictions, Calvin and Zeisel discovered, and there are 3,007 or 800 cases, that 5% of the time, the judge would have acquitted when the jury convicted. Okay. I'm sorry, 5%. Sorry? Yes. So, this is not a final answer to the question. This is just a preliminary start. Right? What we learned from the Calvin and Zeisel work was that if you take judge and jury disagreements at all seriously, there's pretty good reason to think that the false acquittal rate is about four times as high as the false conviction rate. Right? Remember, there were 5% of the time the judge disagreed with the conviction, 20% of the time the judge disagreed with the acquittal. Okay? That's about where scholarship in this field stood until the Innocence Projects emerged, which gave us a new and in some ways much more reliable source of data information, in particular by the use of DNA technology. Basically, although DNA has been around as a, something that biologists play around with for 40 years now, right, it wasn't until the early 1990s that DNA technology became sophisticated enough and reliable enough that it could be used as a form of expert testimony in trials. Okay. That set up a wonderful situation for people interested in research like me. Because what you had, you could look at what were the conviction rates in the 1980s for violent crimes. Once DNA evidence was available, what were the conviction rates? What we would expect is that when DNA evidence becomes available, both the false conviction rate and the false acquittal rate fall, right? You can see why both those would be the results. Because if the defendant's sample, blood sample, let's say, or DNA sample, corresponds to that of the perpetrator, that's powerful evidence that he's guilty. On the other hand, if there's not a match between the defendant's DNA and the DNA found on the victim, then that's a powerful exculpatory piece of evidence. Right? So there was really an abrupt break there's a man by the name, good friend of mine, by the name of Michael Reisinger. Reisinger decided to take advantage of this historical anomaly, namely that prior to 1980, there was no DNA to be had. But once 1980 came along, you could suddenly use the DNA to go back and check on the reliability of verdicts during the 1980s when DNA evidence was not available. What he did in particular, I'll write his name, uh, Michael Reising. He is at the Seton Hall Law College in New Jersey and he's written a great deal on procedural law. What Reisinger did was to identify all of the cases that had occurred in the 1980s in the state of New York that involved the charge of murder-rape. That is murder and rape. Okay. The nice thing, if you can think of there being any nice thing about murder-rape, is that they almost invariably lead to the availability of bodily fluids from both the victim and from the perpetrator. Okay. What he had was about 120 cases 
during the 1980s that had led to convictions of someone for this joint crime of murder-rape. And it's the practice in America, I don't know whether it is in Spain or not, that prosecutors are required, after a trial is over, to save evidence, save all the evidence that was used in the trial, until such time as the defendant, if he's convicted, is released from prison. Now, if you are convicted of murder-rape in America, you're probably given a prison sentence of about 20 years. Right? So, you've got this evidence being stored in various police laboratories that Riesinger was able to get access to, and he ran, or rather he got a laboratory to run, DNA tests on all DNA comparisons in all of these murder-rape cases that had led to conviction to see if there was a match between the DNA of the victim, sorry, the DNA of the perpetrator, and the DNA of the defendant who was convicted for the crime. The figure that Reisinger came up with, in effect what he's doing is discovering false positives, right? false convictions. If there's not a match in the DNA, then there's powerful reason to believe that the defendant did not commit the crime that he was charged with. What Reisinger found was that in 3.8% of the cases that he studied, and he studied all the cases of murder-rape that occurred in the state of New York in the preceding 10 years, 3.8% of them proved to be false convictions. There was no match, no DNA match. And of course, having discovered that, he was a director of one of the Innocence Projects um, in the eastern part of the United States. Uh, they went to exoneration hearing in order to get their clients out of jail because of the failure of this DNA matchup. Now, what Riesinger has claimed, and he's done other studies too, but this is the most powerful one that he's done, is that whether you look to the work of Gross, who's another person who's associated with Innocence Project work, or at Reisinger, what you find is that in the United States now there are 18, no, sorry, 15 different studies, and in England there are three different studies that involve use of DNA in cases where DNA would be highly relevant evidence. And what they've discovered is the range of false convictions is between 2.7 and 4%. Okay. Now, is this compelling evidence? Is it hard evidence? No, but it's highly suggestive because of these 18 studies that have been done, they're all indicating false conviction rates within a very close margin of one another. Right? We're talking about essentially the range between 2 and 4%. There are other ways of doing this, trying to get at the false conviction rate, namely using and Jordi and I once talked about this about two years ago, perhaps doing it in Spain, using post-trial surveys of defense counsel. Right. Namely, asking a defense count of someone who has defended someone in a, in a criminal trial, do you or do you not believe that your client, whether he was acquitted or convicted, actually committed the crime that he was charged with. Okay. Now, there are certain problems associated with that. One can imagine reasons why some people might not want to be candid, honest in answering the question, but it's again a stab at trying to get a sense of this because in general, at least in American law, and I suspect even more so in Spanish law, the defense counsel is among the most privileged positions 
to speak knowledgeably about whether his client did or did not commit a crime. And those, there have been a few studies of that sort that have been done. What they're pointing to is that defense counsel tend to say their client was wrongly convicted about four to five percent of the time. Okay. The rest of the time they're acknowledging that in their belief the guy was guilty and he was convicted. Uh, and that is slightly higher than the three percent I've been talking about here, but again it has a strong family resemblance to it. There's just so many sources from which the information seems to be indicating a reasonably narrow range in which it appears to be plausible to say this is approximately how often convictions are mistaken. Okay. Now, what about the counterpart question? How often do false acquittals occur? It's hard to do research carefully on that issue because almost nobody gives a damn how often false acquittals happen. Right? I'm not aware of anyone in England, for instance, who's ever studied the question, how often do we, Englishmen, acquit people who are guilty? But if you're going to get anywhere with the Laplacian social contract idea, you've got to have some basis for coming up with an answer to the question, how often do we acquit people who in fact committed the crime that they were charged with, arrested for, perhaps tried for, if it, were, if it led to a trial? How, how many of those are false verdicts? Now remember going back to Calvin and Zeisel, they were estimating that the false acquittal rate was about 20%. We have a significant amount of data that I think indicates that it's significantly higher than that. I'll mention some of the sources. What I'll be working my way to is an estimate, kind of meta-analysis, that the false acquittal rate, at least in the United States, and at least where crimes, trials dealing with violent crimes are concerned, the false acquittal rate, false negative rate, is about 38 okay. percent. How on earth do I come up with that idea? Well, I've already mentioned that if you look at Calvin and Zeisel, they're getting finding that judges disagree 20 percent of the time about whether somebody who was acquitted has a guilt provable beyond a reasonable doubt. If you would ask the judge a different question, namely, okay, never mind reasonable doubt, do you believe that the defendant, in this case, committed the crime? You would almost certainly have more than 20% of the judges saying, yes, indeed. Right? Because if 20% of them think that, he was, that the defendant, and 20% of the cases, the, def the judge where he disagrees with the jury thinks that the defendant was guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, there are presumably going to be a, a non-trivial number of cases where the judge agrees with the jury that his, he's not guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, but rather where he holds the defendant to have probably committed the crime, but that the evidence was not powerful enough to convict him. For me, however, the most telling source of this, namely information about false acquittal rates in the Anglo-Saxon world, comes from the wonderful Scottish legal system. Okay. The Scottish legal system is a kind of mix of Roman and Anglo-Saxon law, as you know. But in most pertinent respects, it's quite similar to the American and the English one. There is a trial by jury, routinely. The standard is proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, the judge has no role except supervising the trial. Right? Most of the rules of procedure are very similar. Okay? But what's wonderful about Scotland 
if you're an empiricist like me, is that the Scottish have this three-set verdict open to the jury. Specifically, a Scottish jury who consists of 15 people, not 12, not that that's particularly important, a Scottish jury is told at the beginning of a criminal trial that you have three options open to you. You can find the defendant guilty. To do that, you have to be convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that he did it. Or you can find the defendant not guilty if you're persuaded that it's more likely that he's innocent than that he's guilty. Or, third verdict, you can give a verdict of guilt not proven, which means you think he's guilty, but you don't have enough evidence to persuade you beyond a reasonable doubt that he's guilty. Now that's just the set of folks I'm looking for in terms of trying to get my data. Namely, people who are acquitted, but acquitted despite the fact that there's fairly powerful reason to think that they're guilty, but not powerful enough to satisfy the standard of proof. What the data coming from Scotland show is that approximately 36% sorry, of the people who are tried for a crime and are acquitted receive this middle verdict, namely guilt not proven. That's the jury's way of saying to the world and to the community, be wary of this guy. He probably did it. All right? No, seriously, that, if that's the message that this verdict is meant to send. It's also interesting, and I think very commendable on the part of the Scots, that they actually have an innocent verdict. An innocent verdict means we think he did not commit the crime. That's so much more informative than saying, well, um, we think that um, the probability that he committed the crime is less than 90%. That doesn't tell you anything you want to know. Should we believe he's guilty? That's what I want to hear from a jury. But leave that to one side for the moment. Now, why this is relevant to my concern is that we've got a wonderful setup in, Scot in Scottish criminal trial where we have a jury telling us precisely how many people are they acquitting whom they believe to be guilty of the crime. Right? And I make the assumption, perhaps a dangerous one, but I think not very, that that defines the class of false negatives fairly neatly and cleanly. Because a false negative is a person who is acquitted, but probably guilty. Right? That's what we under. That's what I understand a false negative to be. So I've drawn fairly heavily in the book that I'm working on now, on trying to analyze the Scottish situation in particular, because I think it it gives us more precise figures than one gets out of either England or the U.S. Um, but if you, again, aggregate all these different ways of estimating the frequency of false acquittals, and you average them up, you find that the likelihood is coming out somewhere in the upper 30s, 30 percent. Something like about a third, at least, of false acquittals, so of acquittals are false. Okay. Now, that tells us something very interesting, doesn't it, when you think about it? I said we were going to take a break. Let's take it in just a second. Let me finish this thought, and then we'll get together in five minutes. Um, we've got a way of coming up with an approximation in American law to the frequency of false convictions. My best guess is roughly 3%, and the frequency of false acquittals. And my best guess is the upper 30s, something like 36, 37, 38 percent. 
once we have those error rates, we're in a position to begin to do the Laplacian calculation, right? because you can't do the Laplacian calculation until you know what are the false positive and the false negative rates. So my talks in the next two seminars are going to rest on the assumption number one, that about 3% of the time a conviction is false, and about 35 to 40% of the time an acquittal is false. Okay? And it's on that that I'll be building the story that I'll be trying to tell you at the next meeting of the seminar. If we may, let's take a break for five and then we'll resume the dialogue, okay? okay.